Good morning. I promise I won't keep you long. I'm sure you're all hungry, but I must say there's there's drawing the short straw and then there's drawing the broken straw. And I grew I drew both the straw that was broken and the shortest one in the pack by coming behind Leslie and Lisa. What? So there you go. So stay awake, my friends. Maybe I'll give you something that'll be worth listening to. So Anyway, yes, my name is Mary Jane James, a bit of a mouthful in itself, and I am the uh, CEO of the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton. Now I will have to fake that I can read my notes and put my glasses on. <laughs> I am truly honored to be with, here with you this morning on this beautiful Saturday. I'm not sure about my path of getting here, but I did have the privilege of uh, meeting Lisa, or Tracy, I'm sorry, and sharing coffee with her some time back. And I was completely inspired by her and her mission of, of uh, and commitment to grow women leaders. And when she asked me to speak at this event, I certainly was hesitant because I thought, well, what would I really have to share or say that would be of value or of interest to anyone in the room? But uh, she convinced me that uh, there would be at least one other person. So uh, here I am. Um, Tracy asked me to speak about uh, cultivating a career that fulfills your life. So my message is going to be focused on a couple of things that are important to me. Every journey is different and that journeys are very rarely straight lines. In fact, most look quite zigzaggy and circular in, in size. Most women at some point in their life will experience what is known as imposter syndrome meaning that we don't feel worthy to be where we are or to be doing what we are doing and that imposter sy syndrome can often impede or in fact derail our biggest dreams and plans. And three, that in order to have a fulfilling career you have to find something that you believe in, one that inspires you and fuels you with passion. This does not necessarily mean that your career needs to be in the not-for-profit world. Obviously we've just heard from a couple of amazing women and who don't work in the not-for-profit world, but it means that you will rarely be fulfilled by doing something that doesn't bring you joy and a sense of purpose. So my story. My story uh, began in 1959 in a very small town of Summerside, Prince Edward Island, which is the smallest province in Canada, for those of you who may be new to, to our great country. I was the second oldest of four children, and my home was a very traditional one, particularly in that era. My dad was the breadwinner, and my mom stayed at home, a situation not, not unlike every other family I knew at that time. I knew from a very early age that boys and girls were treated differently, and sometimes, and in fact most often, unequally. My younger sister and I were always called upon to do the dishes and to help mom clean the house on Saturday mornings. My brothers were never called upon to do these sorts of mundane chores, but instead were given more boy chores, like stoking the coal furnace. Yeah, we had a coal furnace then that was in the garage and, and threw up an underground pipe. The coal somehow heated our house, which was on the same part, it was crazy. And that was how we heated our house until I was 12 or so. And then they would shovel the driveway and mow the grass and do those sorts of things. So, you know, and in addition to that, my sister and I did girl things like take figure skating lessons and piano lessons. And my boy, my brothers played hockey and played on sports teams that were exclusive only to boys. My dad traveled a lot and my mother was largely in charge of parenting. I always felt loved even if the words were rarely spoken, and I always worked hard to never disappoint my parents. I loved having my mom at home when I came home from school, usually with something freshly baked out on the counter waiting, waiting for us. But there were things about that traditional household that I knew, even at a young age, that I would never accept. Starting with the ritual that occurred every Thursday morning, with my dad doling out $20 bills, one at a time, so that mom could get the groceries. If she asked for more than the typical weekly allotment, he would question why, after which he would fling another 20 or two on the table. I made a promise to myself that I would never be dependent on anyone for money or survival. And nor should you. In high school, uh, discussions started to take place around our kitchen table about college and university. My older brother was encouraged to attend university and take a business degree. 
When I hit grade 12, I decided that that's what I wanted to do too. And my dad asked incredulously why I would want to do that. Why didn't I just get a job as a secretary or something? That I would, should just get a job to support myself because I would be getting married anyway and be staying home with the kids. What did I need to go to university for? I stood up to my father for one of the very few, few times I had the courage to do so. And I told him that I wanted to have the same opportunities as my brother that I wanted to go to university and that yes, I was actually interested in business. Despite his vote of non-confidence, I moved to Halifax. I attended Mount St. Vincent University, which by the way was an all-girls university at that time. And during those four years though, I often questioned myself, what was I doing there? That maybe business wasn't something that I should be taking. That maybe I should do something a little simpler and a little more in line at that time with what women and girls took. Even back then, my, my l lack of self-confidence often reared its, its ugly head. However, one of the many things that my father taught me was to fight for what I believed in, and in 1981, I proudly graduated with that damn business degree with honors. Yeah. <laughs> I spent the next few years working in Halifax while being in and out of a relationship that I not, now realize was not only toxic, but it was abusive. This took more toll on my confidence, but I didn't realize how much stress I was under until I landed in the hospital in 1986 and was given the diagnosis of MS. This was another giant hurdle. I was told that it would be risky to have children and that the long-term prognosis was very uncertain. With the love and support of my family and friends, I knew I needed a change. And in 1987, I moved to Edmonton to get my head on straight. That's how, how my father described it. It was a struggle to feel like I belonged in a place where I came knowing only two people. But here I am, 32 years later, still fighting. And Edmonton is where I call home. Of course, I will never forget my island roots, but given that I do hate potatoes, I really do. <laughs> I, I cannot swim a stroke. I'm sure I would drown. And I am very, very allergic to fish. Alberta is likely a better fit for me anyway. <laughs> my husband and one of my sons and my daughter are sitting in the very back row um, um, offering me their support. And I'm sure they've heard this story many times. They're probably doing the eye roll right now. But anyway, uh, I met my wonderful husband, Rob, uh, in 1988. And we were married a couple of years later. He was a young, up-and-coming lawyer. And I was the administrator for a prominent Edmonton law firm. We had a great thing going. And finally, after years of not really knowing what a healthy relationship was, I was happy. And I finally felt like I was in the right place. We talked about kids. But given that we didn't get married until what would have been then considered later in life, we weren't sure if we were too old to make babies. Very funny, since we somehow managed to have three kids in a little less than three years. <laughs> a, little, a little more than three years. God, the other would have been impossible. <laughs> Even before I was pregnant with our first child, Rob and I talked about the fact that I did not want to be a stay-at-home mom. I thought I had put too much into the development of my professional career and further remembering back to the Thursday morning kitchen table rituals, I did not want to be financially or otherwise dependent. Rob was very supportive of this, or at least he said he was, and never once encouraged me to do anything other than what I wanted to do. After a difficult pregnancy and delivery, Paul was born and we were head over heels in love with him. It was like no one else had ever made a baby. <laughs> Still planning to return to work, I enjoyed every second of my time with my little boy. However, somewhere during those months at home, I had an unexpected change of heart. I just somehow knew that I couldn't leave my baby. With Rob's support again, I stayed home for 15 years. Those years could only be described as happy, crazy, stressful, annoying, dizzyingly busy, all of those things. But I was happy to be an at-home mom, immersing myself into my children's lives and their activities, volunteering with their schools and our community. But all was not idyllic. Weirdly, my confidence took yet another attack, this time from women. <coughs> Weirdly, I became acutely aware that women can be cruelly hard on one another, Absolutely. although perhaps not intentionally. I was often asked, what do you do all day? Things like, must be nice, and aren't you bored, yeah. were said. 
at things, at events that I attended with my husband, I was always asked by other women, what do you do? And many times I felt some of these women would immediately disengage, like what could I possibly have to say that would be interesting? Looking back, I do realize that it may have been my own insecurities that allowed me to feel this. These experiences taught me many things, but most important of those is that a woman's choice to be a mom is a very individual one, and so is the choice to stay at home with your children or to also work outside of the home. While neither choice may be perfect, we do what is best for our family and ourselves. Some of us may have a choice, and some of us do not. We cannot judge one another. We must lift each other up and not turn against each other ever. Well. The years flew by, and after almost 15 years of being at home, I decided it was time to slightly change course. I wanted to go back to work part-time. I wanted to re-engage. I wanted to do something that would make a difference. I didn't know what that would look like, but I knew that I did not want to return to my former professional life. I started volunteering on the crisis line at the Sexual Assault Center, and soon after I was asked to work a few hours a week writing and reporting on grants, something I knew I could do even after being away from the workforce for so long. The flexible schedule suited me perfectly, and I was really looking forward to being part of the workforce again. Again, though, sometimes I felt like an imposter. I told my stay-at-home mom friends that I had returned to work part-time at the Sexual Assault Center. They were initially shocked, but then typically responded with, wow, that's really tough. Why do you want to do that? I didn't even know we had a sexual assault center. And then, well, uh, anyway, how are the kids? I really felt like I was caught between two worlds. My kids were a bit out of sorts with me not being there for them every minute of the day. My youngest, who was 10 at the time and who was sitting up in the back row and he was going to be throwing daggers my way, I'm sure, with this story. But uh, I remember that first morning getting a call from the principal's office. He was 10 at the time. And uh, after he told me that he knew he wasn't supposed to call me at work unless it was really important, he asked if he had to wait until lunch to eat his banana or could he eat it at recess. That's Aww. what was important to him. I felt discomforted in these two colliding worlds, being in a place where I didn't automatically fit in and now away from my kids and feeling guilty about that. In 2011, I became the Assistant Executive, Executive Director of SACE, working a little more than part-time. I had the privilege of working for an organization that I loved, one that cared deeply about and supported people who had been hurt and traumatized in unspeakable ways, and one that taught me about compassion in a way I never knew possible. It was through this journey that I realized that I, myself, am a survivor. Although before, before I started working at SACE, I never really considered myself a survivor of sexual assault. I realize now that I remain silent like most other survivors, believing the myths and stereotypical responses and understanding of what sexual violence means, and further, believing that the experience was somehow my fault. My experience was something that I never shared with anyone except my husband, and it is certainly not something that I ever spoke publicly about. However, it, however, it has been through this journey of reflection and acknowledgement of my own lived experience that I really began to understand the enormity, enormity and prevalence of this issue. I became so impassioned by the problem that I submerged myself in the work and promised myself that I would never stop advocating for survivors <coughs> and that I would never stop listening to, believing and supporting anyone who has been victimized by this horrific crime. Early into my new professional journey, a friend of mine gave me a book that has been my barometer and my compass, both professionally and personally. The name of the book is The Four Agreements by Don Mikhail Ruiz. Probably messed that last name up. And anyway, many of you may own or have read the book, but I have to tell you that whenever I am, am in doubt about any decision I need to make, any bridge I need to cross, or any lesson I need to teach, I refer to this book, and also, almost without question, it has become my guiding light. Those four agreements are, be impeccable with your word, avoid gossip, lies, empty promises, and other ways in which we cause problems with our words. With our words. Say what you mean, and mean what you say. Don't take anything personally. In a nutshell, 
This means understanding how other people's behaviors are a reflection of themselves only, that we all have our own biases and filters through which we see the world. Don't make assumptions. This allows you to understand that a lot of stress can be created when you assume that you know what other people are thinking without checking with them. And the fourth agreement is always do your best. And by this, I believe that the author means to do the best you can at any given moment and you will have no regrets. Some days your best isn't as good as others and that's okay. Four years ago I accepted the board's request to become its CEO. The decision was not made lightly or easily. I knew that while my knowledge and understanding about the issue had obviously grown substantially, I still, I still didn't feel like I could or even wanted to lead the organization. I liked being behind the scenes. Speaking to the media terrified me and I knew it was something I would have to do regularly. With significant encouragement and convincing from my family and the board, I agreed to give it a go. And here I am, right in the thick of it, four plus years later, through the Me Too movement, Leslie, the, the Gian Gameshis, the Harvey Weinsteins, the Jeffrey Epsteins, and too many more to count, I have learned so much, including that I need to put my own securities aside, focus on what's important, and never stop speaking passionately and publicly about this issue. At the same time, I have learned that so many women have experienced some form of sexual violence. In fact, one in three women and girls will experience sexual violence at some point in their lifetime, most often before their 18th birthday. There is no doubt that we all know someone who has been impacted, and I suspect that there may be many in this room, including me. If you would have asked me at any time leading up to 2007 if I imagined myself leading a not-for-profit charitable organization, let alone one that does the work that we do, I'm afraid my answer would have been a solid, not a chance. This organization and everyone involved with it has helped me tremendously to work through discomfort, to become confident as a growing leader, and to understand that I can still be a very good mom, wife, sister, and daughter. For me, it became about the people we supported, and I lost myself in that. My life became much less about me, and perhaps sur surprisingly, or, or not I guess, I, I naturally became more confident. People with much greater problems and insecurities than I could ever imagine having became my focus and my passion. Do I still feel imposter syndrome from time to time? You bet I do. I feel, actually feel imposter syndrome at this very moment. And I bet there are many of you here this morning who have felt and perhaps still feel the same. What we need to remember is that we are all in this together. We need to lift each other up, not tear each other down. We've worked hard to be where we are in our respective lives, and we do not need to defend our decisions to anyone. In the words of Seth Godin, entrepreneur, best-selling author, and speaker. People talk about bike riding when they want to remind us that some things, once learned, are not forgotten. What they don't mention is how we've learned. No one learns to ride a bike from a book or even a video. You learn by doing it, and you learn by not doing it. You learn by doing it wrong, by falling off, by getting back on, and doing it again. Through the many times I have fallen and gotten back up over the course of my life, I continue to learn so much about myself. And with each lesson, <clears throat> I gain more confidence, believing that there is nothing that I cannot do if I really put my mind to it. And I can say with absolute confidence to each one of you that it is never too late or too little to do what you want to do and to be who you want to be. So thank you for that, it's very, very, very appreciated. Before I close, I want to tell you that my father died a very painful death six years ago. And some of his last words to me were, I love you and I am so proud of you. Never stop being, were, being you. His death shattered my world and I believe it has been through his tough love style of parenting and his continuous message to me that in order to be part of a community, you have to pay a little rent, meaning that you have to give back, give back. 
stand up for and help those who need our support and our love, understanding that our community can only be as strong as its weakest links. That's it. Lunch is going to be served. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my story.